Hello and a very warm welcome once again to the Change Exchange where we talk about the change moments of life and our decisions and how we make them, who we share them with. My guest today, Amore Becker, um, household name on Aris Gier where I also spent some time of my life so it feels like a, a good connection. Thank you. And uh, Amore is taking over from me at Veranderdinge on CakeNet at the moment so uh, our paths have crossed. You're so welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. You studied drama. Did you want to act? Yes. Um, when I grew up, I was an extrovert. I'm still one. But <laughs> those days, what do you do if you're an extrovert? You know, uh, you think, I should just become an actress. You know, And that's why I thought, yeah, let me study drama. But then when you finished, you didn't. Yeah. Uh, I, I went for many auditions, Ruda, but I never succeeded in one. So uh, I was unemployed and then I thought, let me just do whatever I can find to do. And uh, it wasn't an easy time in my life. It, I was just thinking it must have been hard because one has to earn a living. Yes. So what did you do? So I did waitressing. I, I had the opportunity to travel to New Zealand and You Canada. sheared sheep. And there I sheared sheep. <laughs> and it, it was for three months in my life. It was terrible. But if I look back now, it was a great character building phase of my life. How you did know? you learn to do it? Oh, I, I ended up in this little town on the South Island called Otautau. And um, I was there with a boyfriend of mine who was a doctor. And I thought, I can't sit at home all the time. And so I, there was no restaurant in town. So I heard that uh, there are people who, who does shearing, sheep shearing. And I thought, well, let me, let me go. Let the cotton clock. Let me see what I can do. And so I started as a, a rouseabout. That means you uh, you take um, the first week because you've got to start somewhere. You can't start at the top as a sheep shearer. Sheep shearer. Start at the bottom. You'll cut off their ears. <laughs> oh. And uh, so my first week, I had to take um, um, sheep dung. I must drollen van die wolle afval. That was my first week. My first week, drollen van die wolle. Then after that, I was promoted to um, do, uh, you know, to sort out the wool, the good wool. And then um, two weeks after that, I was put on sheep, sheep shearing. And it wasn't with the, with the uh, scissors, like many uh, shearers do in South Africa. It was the, with the electrical uh, uh, what do you call it? You Say electrical scissors. Yeah. But Ruda, it was a very hard time for me because I was not used to physical labor. And for the first month and a half, I was on Voltaren injections because, you know, your back, your back and everything. Um, and uh, so I gained 10 kilograms, not of the physical work, but of the beer after the, <laughs> after the job. Yeah, every day we finish our job with a uh, beer. It was... You know, I looked so forward to that beer because that was the only thing that I could look forward to. You know, it yeah. was just such a boring job, but it was good character building. And then you came back to South Africa, and how did you get into radio? Oh, man. So I came back to South Africa thinking, still thinking I want to be an actress, still going for auditions. Didn't get a job, so my parents in the meantime moved to Port Elizabeth, and uh, I had to go stay with my parents. And... Then I became a waitress at the Spur, like all wannabe actresses, you become a waitress. And uh, I actually started to enjoy it a lot. And then I, um, uh, a neighbor of my parents uh, said, well, uh, the story of ship shearing, sheep shearing, the radio must hear about that. And then he organized that I go to Ari Schi and tell them my story and there, uh, Gerda Kutsia said, of who was then at Aris here, said, please, oh, you must go for an audition. And then I got an audition at Radio Algoa, and that's how it all happened. But they made you change your name. <gasps> oh, my goodness, yes. So at Radio Algoa, I was, uh, you see, I was Heta Becker until the age of 25. And um, at Radio Algoa, I was still Heta Becker, but then I wanted to go back to Cape Town. And uh, so I did an audition at uh, Radio Good Hope. And then they said, yes, uh, because this job at Radio Go, it was just two, twice a week, you know, the um, graveyard shift. And so I auditioned for a proper job at Radio Good Hope. And they said, 
okay, we, we, we would love to have you here, but there's just one problem. And I said, what? They said, oh my goodness, with a name like Heta Baker, you can never be on radio. It sounds too fat and conservative. So they said, please, man, don't you have another name? And then my second da- name is Armour. And then we just put the E at the end that it rolls better. So from then on, I became Amore Becker. How does that play in one's head? Because your whole identity is tied up in your name. Yes, because you become your name and yes. your name becomes you. It was very difficult in the beginning yeah. to, to get uh, to express myself with a different rhythm because Amore has a different rhythm than Heta. But if I look back now, the name Heta is just, uh, uh, it, it, I was a real tomboy and the name Amore is more feminine. So perhaps that sort of in a way forced me to um, embrace my femininity a bit more, I think, I think. Uh, but yeah, it was difficult in the beginning. Yeah, it's fascinating. And then you decided to come to Johannesburg without having a job yet, am I right? Yes. Woo! Um, <laughs> Yes, um, but before that, I, I, I was working at KFM and uh, I just, uh, I, I got tired and bored with commercial radio because with commercial radio, you can only announce the song and announce, announce the time and that's mm. it, you know, you can't really go in depth. Mm. So I, um, I went for many auditions. So I, I stopped working at KFM. But the day I stopped working at KFM, look, I'm an Aquarian, so I believe, let me make my decision now, life will happen the way it should. So I, I resigned. resigned at KFM. Yeah. And that very day, I got uh, a fax from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association in America. Yes. And they said, come and w- uh, we, we heard about you and we want to bring a play to Cape Town. And will you please... Uh, uh, Organize the play for us. Yeah, and we're going to pay you in dollars. Don't worry, you don't have to save a soul. We're going to pay you pay in dollars. <laughs> so I said, thank you very much. Who am I to say no? So they flew me to Minnesota. And then I met the most wonderful people. And then I worked for them for six months in Cape Town. Uh, and being paid in dollars. Pay, being paid in dollars. You know, with a, What's not to like? Start, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, after that, I read, read news on ETV in the mornings. So I had to wake up at 3 o'clock. That was <sighs> terrible. It was, I cannot tell you. And then um, after that, I, uh, my brother sold his house in Pretoria. And they, no, he didn't sell his house. He uh, got a job in Nigeria. And he said, please come and have a look at my, at my house. Come and house it. Yeah. By then, I've exhausted all the resources in Cape Town. Jobs, men. <laughs> All opportunities, you know, Cape Town is so And you small. had a, a fistful of dollars. Yes, yes. And, uh, and then I came to Josie. Oh, no, to Pretoria first. And then I couldn't, I couldn't get back into the broadcasting market. I struggled. And then I begged Rusks. I'm all, uh, what does that teach? I mean, if you have to speak, speak to a young person now who's looking for a job, fail audition oh, after audition, um, and now you're in Pretoria, you've worked in radio, but you can't find another opening. What does one do? How does one approach that? How do you overcome that? Certain people say it is waiting, but the moment you give it a name like waiting, then your life becomes one long drag. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, it sounds totally passive. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you judge the waiting as well, and then it be- mm. it's not good. Um, I see it as... You do whatever you find in the meantime to stay part of the rhythm of the universe, you know. So uh, start somewhere. Yeah, just start somewhere, Mm -hmm. and uh, and if you look back, that is actually those are the things that make your life interesting. (laughs) Those are the things. I mean, uh, we haven't really spoken about about my broadcasting career (laughs) yet. We're only talking about the interesting things that I've done outside of broadcasting. So you just do whatever you find to do. I was I was making I was baking rusks for a bakery in Pretoria, and I was uh, uh, also a waitress in the evenings there at a lovely restaurant called the Lucid Candle Garden. And then I uh, I had a friend who got a permanent job. 
she was also unemployed as an as a secretary at a medical aid and she asked her boss if she can share the job with me so she worked for two and a half days per week as a medical secretary and I the other two days we loved it so Sunday evenings we phone each other and say which two and a half days will you come and work you know <laughs> And then how did you get back into radio? So, I... I Were you constantly looking still? I was constantly looking. Mm. I wanted to work at Aries here because the content matters there. You know, mm. you can really come with new suggestions and it doesn't have to be like a commercial radio station, just mm. a lot of music. And I went there for auditions again and I didn't get a job. One day, the boyfriend I was living with then at that time he wanted a house and I said don't worry I'll go look for a house for you and um, uh, the estate agent I went with her and I told her about my dream to work at Aries here and she said you know there's a woman now at Aries here the, the boss um, why don't you go there for an audition I said I've been there for so many times as a, for an audition she said but have you tried with the women boss and I said no with a female boss she said, but you must try. I said, okay. And I went home and that evening I had a wonderful dream. In my dream, one of the broadcast, one of the presenters of Aries here came to me in my dream and said, Amora, you better come quickly because there's many people wanna, who want a job here. Better come now. And then I, uh, the next morning I phoned the program manager who stared in pro. I didn't even speak to the boss and I said, Hello Terence, it's Amore here. I just want to remind you I'm here in Gauteng. He said, Amore, where are you? I said, no, I'm Pretoria. He said, because one of our presenters is leaving us and we're looking for someone who can do his job. Sure. So it happened miraculously, you know, when yeah. the time was right. I also believe in perfect order. When the time is right. Yeah. When the t but look, you can only become a presenter if you have a story to tell. Actually, if you think about it, it's about mm. telling stories. And by then, I had so much hardship. <laughs> I had so many stories. Yeah. <laughs> what is the, the special thing about radio? Oh, my goodness. Um, it's immediate and it's intimate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 talk to me about the bond that you have formed with your audience on Chyla Tate. Okay. Um, so when you speak to masses, you speak to no one when you're on radio. Mm. When you speak to one, you speak to masses. <laughs> yeah, so it, after all, it's just one person sitting on the other side of the radio. So I, when I speak, I imagine I'm, I'm chatting with my dad. And I know my dad loves me. <laughs> and I know my dad doesn't judge me for everything. So I, I, I speak to my dad. And that's how I believe I connect with people. Yeah. Mm. How did food become such a strong element of what you do? Um, my whole life, I wanted to know what's, what is my goal in life. And uh, I, at school, I never did any sport. My parents were so in love with each other that they, didn't, they were not worried about academics. They never really pushed us. They were so into each other, you know. Um, and uh, they gave us a lot of freedom and I never really had hobbies. There's only two things that I liked in my life and that's eating and talking. <laughs> yeah. And, and so you, you incorporated that into your show. Yeah and, yeah. Uh, and, and I grew up in a family where everything happened around food. Mm. The sad things, the good things, Everything happened around food, so that, for me, I see it as a way of expressing. And on the other side, Ruda, um, uh, we have to eat, you know, to stay alive. You might as well enjoy yeah. every meal. Yeah. You have said that when you were really sad, you always make sure that you go home and cook yourself a good meal. Yes, because life just looks so much better on a full tummy. <laughs> Yeah, that is can, true. You can handle anything so much better <laughs> on a full tummy. And not KFC and chips. No, not at all. <laughs> and now, for uh, Anna television, how did that come about? Um, yeah, Alan Ford phoned me one day and uh, 
I had a stint with TV 20 years ago, mm. but I did not really enjoy it, it, enjoyed it that much. I did not really enjoy it that much. Um, yeah, so... Why? Um, because it, it was a comedy show. I was totally out of my depth. Mm. Totally you just out of my depth. Didn't feel at home. Yes. Mm. And, um, but your body tells you that, hey? Yeah. If, and if you're not excited about a thing, you must listen to your body. And I was not that excited, but this was the mid-90s, and I thought, okay, this is the natural step. Now I'm excited. I'm more excited now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's see what happens. Yeah, and so it, you've had a few day, days of filming. How did you experience it? Look, I had my, f my first interview <laughs> with you, so it was a bit of a, oh my goodness. But then I thought, no, man, I can't be ruder. I must just yeah. be me. Yes. But you know, Ruda, I'm so interested in, in people's stories and what makes them tick and, and how, do they, how did they survive mm. their life. Mm. So I'm very interested in that and that's what I'm going to focus on like you did as well. You know, mm. We're talking about the changing moments because change happens. Change, tax and death <laughs> happens. So what can, what can people expect in this new season? Well, yeah, once again, speaking to well-known South Africans who've gone through hardship and uh, hopefully, hopefully original ways of tackling change mm. and authentic ways of tackling change. Mm. So, yeah, we hope for that. Talking about that in your own life, mm -hmm. um, uh, just in your personal life, apart from the career side, the landing that job side, you almost moved to Greece in order to marry a Greek. Yes. And then what happened? Oh my goodness. So when I took the final step and emigrated, and there I landed on the island of Rhodos. It was winter in Greece, and you know, the islands, they go back 2,000 years ago, in, in, during winter, you know. Suddenly nobody speaks English. <laughs> Suddenly, you s they, there's no need to speak English because there's nothing to sell. Anyway, but that was, I didn't uh, give that any energy because I loved this Greek god, just for interesting sake. His name was Stathis, but my dad could not pronounce it lekker, so he called him Skatkas. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a Skatkas. Anyway, <laughs> so when I was there, um, I had, now for, that's not my final, you know, to be with him, I had this very uncomfortable feeling. And I didn't know where it came from. I lost all my joy, Ruda. In a matter of two weeks there, I lost my joy. I did not know what it was. And I could not find my joy in Greece. And then I, I knew that was the sign. That, was, that it's not for me. But it was so difficult because mm. I loved this man so much. And I went away with a big hoo-ha, mm. you know. Um, everyone knew I was going to Greece to start a new life there. This was uh, the end of 1993 when, you know, South Africans, we didn't know what was going to happen in 1994. And, oh my goodness, this is a good chance for me to... Mm. So I had to come back and it was, well, it was so embarrassing. And my heart was still so sore because I missed him so much. I still loved him. Mm. So besides the heartache, on the other side, I also had to find out why... And where was God in those very, very uh, lonely moments when I asked God, just please explain to me, um, how come I'm so in love with this man, but I've lost my joy? Please explain mm -hmm. that to me. Mm -hmm. That later on, I said to God, you know what, you must talk now. You know, you and I are the only people on this island who understand Afrikaans. <laughs> please talk to me loudly. I, I'm open to hear what you have to say. And then I realized long after that, that um, that was actually um, God speaking to me. Call it your sixth sense, your intuition. Mm. Um, that his voice lives inside you. Yes, mm. that was his way of telling me, look, if this is not bringing you joy, it's not for you. Also means that a relationship is not just about the two people. Hmm? Absolutely. It, is, it goes much wider than mm. that. And then you had a, a really serious and, and deep relationship with uh, Robbie Mm. What was Robbie's surname? Nut. Nut. Robbie yeah, Nut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what made that work? Because we, before we talk about the end. Because he had his own life. Mm -hmm. And that was so attractive. He had his own life, his own passions, his hobbies. And I had my own life. So that was very attractive. Mm -hmm. 
um, that made it work. And but it was also there was enough that you have in, had in common, as opposed to your Greek mm. god, yeah. uh, that that you could find a, a shared space. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. We, in, yeah, we had a lot in common. And then he died in an aircraft accident. How does one overcome that? Yo, um, Ruda. Um, Oh, there's so many layers of mm -hmm. how to overcome it. Um, I, I immediately saw a traumatologist uh -huh. just to help me just get through the day. And the traumatologist said, gave me two amazing quotes. that I, th Those two quotes helped me on my path of healing. The one was that um, despite the pain and the devastation of a trauma, there's perf perfect order always. That was the one quote. The other one was that there's always a link between a past trauma and a current trauma or past pain and a current trauma. And this trauma happens many times so that a past trauma can come to the surface and that you can tackle that. So that's a long deep story. But those mm. two quotes helped me through my healing. So I went, went through a lot of therapy. Mm. But the biggest thing, so what so my life changed immediately. Okay, one thing I'm made for, I am made for big crises, not small crises. So um, what happened immediately was um, I had to get my life quickly together because I had to broadcast in two weeks' time. I'm, I'm freelance, so you cannot, if you don't work, you don't get paid. So I took off two weeks after his death. And I was wondering how on earth am I going to go back to my job because in my job, I must be in a very good mood every day. And you know You what? must project energy. You must project energy. Yeah. And after all, your voice yeah. is the muscle of your soul. Yes. And your soul is not in a good place. How on earth are you going to handle this? So now to come back to my passions, eating and talking. So my whole life, I've been asking God, what is my goal in life? So now I was 44 when this happened. So... I was wondering, how on earth am I going to broadcast? Mm. I can't lie to the people. Mm. They will hear I'm sad. Mm. So, Ruda, in those two weeks, it dawned on me what my goal is in life. And I realized it is eating and talking. And that gave me so much joy. Look, there's a difference between joy and happiness. Mm -hmm. Joy, if you know what your joy is, if you know what you're, if you're on your path, mm. you know, if you're on, there's a lovely quote that says, you are chronically tired because you're not on your path. Mm. If you know what's your path, then you have that joy. It stays the same. Where happiness comes and goes, you know, you get a fine today, tomorrow <laughs> somebody hits you on the head, then you're unhappy. Mm. But your joy stays constant. So, I realized that I'm you're actually in the right place. I realized I've mm. lost, I've, I realized I'm sad, yes, but I have not lost my joy. Mm. And your joy, that is where God is, man. That's <laughs> where God is. That's where you get your energy from, you know. Yeah. Um, so um, I realized I'm so fortunate to have this job because talking is my passion. So did you, did you talk about this? Did you take your audience into your confidence? So here's the deal. I realized, first of all, okay. So you love eating. Yes, I love eating. Okay, you just see that you eat very well before you go on show. You eat lacquer, you know, you spoil yourself. Because that's a f form of nurturing. Yes. Look, every time when Jesus had something huge to say, it was around food with friends and good wine, and you know. So, food. You first eat. So when your tummy is full, then sing your kans dag. You're ready to face the world. And then... I, uh, so when I first went back on air, I explained to them what happened. It's not as if they didn't know what, yeah. what was happening. So I said, just be with me here. Just, you know, be with me. Um, so, yeah, I, I did not resist that moment. I embraced it. Yeah. So, and with that, I'm sure it, all of that thing, it, it worked for me. Yeah. It worked for me. I didn't fight the pain. It worked for me, you know. Yeah. So, but just one, one last thing about mourning. Um, people have all these wonderful things to say about mourning. 
all I can say is mourning exposes you. Mm -hmm. It exposes you. You know, you don't necessarily get to become a better person mm. or um, that there's more meaning in your life. It just exposes you and then you've got to work with that. Yeah. Mm. On a completely practical level, you've lived in the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape and now in Johannesburg. Where do you, where do you want to be and why? Okay, I want to be exactly here where I am, in Johannesburg. Um, I love it here. What I love, two things, three things that I love about Johannesburg. Okay, the weather. No? It's yes. Just, oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> and then the energy of Johannesburg. And you won't believe it, but it's a very nurturing place. Well, Mm. You will believe it because you live here. Yes. You know what I'm talking about. But I have a theory for that. You know, um, when you're in an aeroplane, you don't chat to the people around you. But the moment there's turbulence, you chat to everybody, hey? <laughs> and I believe yeah. us here in Johannesburg, we're always in a state of turbulence. Look, it's not the safest uh, city in the world. Yeah. We're all in a state of turbulence, you know? So we are chatting with each other, yeah. call it nervous energy, uh, whatever, you know, it is just But it's also, thing. we are constantly open to strangers. If you live in, in Cape Town, you have your circle of friends, you don't need anyone else. Here, you will meet a stranger in every situation, so we're always open to that. It's, it's true. A, it's a completely different way of relating. Yes, yeah. and I love the stimulation of Johannesburg, yes. because everybody yeah. comes with a new story. And your home, what makes a home? Your kitchen, obviously. Oh, the smell of food. The smell of food, yes. Um, you know what? Um, there's how did you choose the place where you still, your home, where you are now? Um, how did, it was actually chosen for me. Uh, Robbie, he said, oh, I want to come and show, I want to show you my lo uh, where my mom lives in this lovely estate. I call it a Bangador <laughs> <laughs> in Johannesburg. You know, these security estates. And it was lovely, uh, willow trees, rivers flowing through it. Yeah, so it, it wasn't a difficult choice. I just knew I was, mm. I was supposed to be there. Yeah. Well, Maurice, thank you so much. And good luck for Fir Anadinger. I hope it works for you and that it makes you happy. Thank mm. you, Ruda. And thanks for paving the path for me. Yeah, that's uh, what we do. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's it for this session. Until uh, next time, go well.